Welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church. This is a service of Holy Communion. We invite you to set a space, a sacred holy space, with your elements of bread and wine or grape juice so that you may participate in communion when the time comes. For a document on how to do this and to read a little bit about our theology, that can be found under resources at www.gracelc.org. We are excited to have Pastor Errol Smith with us. He's a friendly face to this congregation, and you might recognize him from worship here at Grace. We are grateful that he will be with us, and a reminder that this is our last week of pre-recorded worship. Beginning next weekend, we welcome our interim pastor team, Becca Ager France and John Spangler, to worship with us here at Grace. Saturday at 5 p.m. will be traditional, and Sunday at 10 a.m., will be contemporary, and our Sunday morning service will be live-streamed. Please prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider. Help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Psalm chapter 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of Mark, reading from chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes... I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he'd entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement and he strictly ordered them that one, no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Thanks be to God. In our gospel today, we hear about two people who are desperate for Jesus. And so I was thinking about the word desperate and what that means. Think about a time that you have been desperate. And while you're thinking, I want you to do something with me. I want you to put your arms up above your head or out to the side, and I want you to leave them there. Grown-ups, I want you to do it with us too. Catherine, you too, behind the camera. So, think about a time that you were desperate. Maybe there was a toy you really wanted or a game that you wanted, and you pulled out all the stops. I'll brush my teeth every morning and night. I'll make my bed every day. I'll clean my room. I'll do my dishes. I'll eat all my vegetables. And the list goes on. You were desperate to get that thing that you wanted, right? And I bet you by now you're starting to feel that in your arms a little bit. Catherine's nodding her head behind the camera. So in our gospel today, we hear about a desperate father who needed Jesus to come and heal his little girl. And we also hear about a woman, and that's all we know. And she was desperate. And what did she do? She touched Jesus' cloak, and he felt the spirit leave his body. So you can go ahead and put your arms down. What a relief that is. You feel your arms are sore, and you can feel that strength has left your body to hold them up. And that's what Jesus felt, and he knew that he had healed somebody. He knew that the spirit had worked within him because she simply touched his cloak. And so I sat and I thought about what that must have been like for Jesus to feel this power leave his body but not know who or what had happened. And so he sought for her, and what did he say? Your faith has healed you. That simple belief, a few weeks ago we heard about a mustard seed so very tiny, that faith so small has healed her. And so we think about this desperation and this, this power that left our bodies to keep our arms up. It took a lot of power and strength, and we felt relief when it was down. And so ways that we can do that in our lives today, a simple hello, inviting your friend down the street to play with your new toy, sitting next to somebody at the park and sharing lunch. All of these ways are the ways in which we give our spirit and show God's love to one another. Let us pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for the power that you give us so that we can show your love to others. Give us the strength to keep going, to give those hellos and those smiles and know that in these simple acts, we are sharing our faith and your love, that the world may be united as siblings in Christ. We pray all of this in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The month was July. The year was 1973. The place was the city of Nice on the French Riviera. It was the grand opening of the Marc Chagall Museum of Art. And what a grand building it really was. It was designed specifically for his works by a prominent Italian architect. And it was built so that the maximum amount of sunlight would fall on his paintings. And it was surrounded by a floral Mediterranean garden that made it look like it was almost a part of the museum. And in addition, it was a special day for Marc Chagall. It was his 86th birthday. Now, the museum was designed specifically to house at least 400 of his works in this magnificent building. Now, on the first floor, the main gallery, what you would find are 12 large paintings, I mean large, five to six feet wide, three to four feet tall, and they depicted various epic events from the books of Genesis and Exodus. And then in a, a, a side gallery, there were five more 
paintings, and these were based upon the most erotic of all the biblical books, the Song of Songs. Now, if you fast forward to the summer of 2019, before the pandemic, a gifted professor of philosophy and religion in a major university in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who is something of a student of modern French culture, was touring the Chagall Museum of Art. And as he moves slowly and thoughtfully from one of these overly large paintings to the next, a thought started running through his mind, which was, I'm waiting for that strange experience when a picture speaks, sometimes in a whisper, sometimes in a shout, sometimes with a reverberating silence that pulls me to the edge of a precipice where I'm not sure whether I'll fall or fly. Well, fast forward again to April of this year, which was when I received my invitation to be a pulpit supply pastor here at Grace. And so I set out immediately in search of a text. And as the church observes a three-year lectionary, I went to reading all four. As you know, there's always one from the Old Testament, then one from the Psalms, which is, of course, also Old Testament, one from the Gospels, and one from the Epistles. Well, after a cursory reading, I quickly eliminated the reading from 2 Samuel and 2 Corinthians and felt that I would try to narrow my view down to the 30th Psalm and the Gospel for the day. It's sometimes difficult as a preacher to really figure out whether I get to choose the text or whether the text gets to choose me. You know, one that will speak in a whisper or a shout or a reverberating silence pulling me to the edge of a precipice where I've got to jump and I will either fall or fly. One thing that made it easier was in choosing this psalm because it's the appropriate one for today and it was also the same reading for the sixth Sunday of Epiphany earlier this year. But the reason the psalm stood out to me was I had just finished reading a book about the psalms. It was a book which was constituted of the prestigious lectures on preaching, the Lyman Beecher lectures at, at Yale University. Uh, back some years, about 2003. And the lecture was given by Dr. Ellen Davis, who is a professor of uh, Old Testament studies at Duke University. And in this uh, book, early on, which is all about the Psalms, on the Psalms and from the Psalms, she said that after working with the Psalms, she found that they were both fun and hard. So I set to work preparing for this sermon by reading and rereading and reading again this psalm, Psalm 30. And then I realized that the heart of the psalm was in its middle, verse 5. There it is, right in the middle. And it is this, for his, meaning God's anger, is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, it looked like I was going to fall rather than fly. For what did I know about God's anger? As I remember my formative years growing up in southwestern Pennsylvania in a small town congregation, we talked a lot about God's love. I don't remember ever talking about God's anger. And I began to question do I even believe that God gets angry at times? Is he cap capable of anger? The Bible says so, and it says that on a number of occasions. But on the other hand, I thought, coming at it from a different perspective, if God could be disappointed in me at times, 
or impatient with me at times, just, just maybe, God could be angry with me or anybody. And if the prophet was really on target and meant what he said when he said, God's ways are higher than our ways and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, well, maybe there is such a thing as God's grace or God's anger. But that his anger may appear a lot different than human anger, particularly if it is saturated with grace and mercy. Now, we sure know what human anger looks like. It's mean. It's punitive. It's ugly. Every time I see in the news details about a mass killing, which seems to happen every week, or a road rage incident or a domestic violence situation, you know what thought runs through my mind? Well, I'll tell you, even if you don't want to know. I think sometimes life is scary, and there are a lot of angry people running around out there. And if you happen to read Bob Bluebaugh's uh, editorial in the Carroll County Sunday Times three weeks ago, he said that most of us are suffering from a condition he called residual pandemic anger. And we have at various levels. We realize that we, we have suffered under a lot of pressure you know, wear the mask, keep your distance, stay away from crowds, stay at home, all that kind of stuff. And in one degree or another, we must admit that we are all inflicted with and suffering from residual pandemic anger. You know, I've even found myself bumping into people. This particular incident happened before the pandemic, and... Uh, I find more and more people who are angry at God. A lot of people are mad at God. Now, that's an excuse some of them give for not coming to church. And it usually has something to do with death and dying. The person I have in mind is a woman whose father died suddenly, either when she was an older child or a teenager. And she said people kept telling her that God needed her dad or God wanted another angel in heaven. And she said, I kept telling them, I needed my dad more than God did. So he said, I don't think God needs another angel to uh, check parking meters or to do crowd control or to sing tenor in the tabernacle choir. She said, I just, I don't believe that kind of God. And I said, I don't either. And I don't pray to that kind of God. I just do not believe that God is in the kidnapping business. But we never did sit down and explore this further, and that's an unfinished agenda. And I'm sure we're not going to solve this theological problem about God's anger quickly or easily. So I want us to just put it on the shelf. Yeah, I'm sidestepping it. And maybe there's another time for that discussion and exploration in a Bible study group or a Sunday school class. So let's leave this first half of verse 5 and give our attention to the second half of verse 5. About weeping, lingering for the night, and joy coming in the morning. And this is where we can easily bridge from the 30th Psalm to chapter 5 in the Gospel of Mark. So imagine for the moment we're walking along with Jesus and we're a part of the crowd, and he is approached by two desperate people. One is a man, has a name, Jairus, and he and approaches Jesus and urges him, urgently urges him to come that his daughter is seriously ill and is dying. And on their way to the home, a second person, a nameless person, a woman, who has this secret desire to touch his cloak or his robe with the hope that 
Just that mere contact would bring healing to her problem as she had been vexed with a problem for 12 years of a hemorrhaging. And that wish, that hope was something she had pinned her hopes on. The, se- the short second half of this verse, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in morning, easily suggests that maybe the father had been spending sleepless nights after sleepless nights worrying about this daughter whom he loved so much. And for these two seekers in the Gospel of Mark, it's turned out to be nighttime 24 hours a day. A father worried about his ill and dying daughter, the other worried about herself. Now, as easy as it would be to give a sermon on each of these characters, for the time being, I've chosen instead to bundle them together, this verse 5 in Psalm 30, and the reading from Mark, and fifth, chap- fifth chapter, and invite you to move with me in another direction. One New Testament scholar was recently on target when he wrote that any chosen piece of scripture carries with it a surplus of meanings. And so in bundling this particular psalm with the morning's gospel lesson, I suggest that we broach another issue that we seldom talk about or don't talk about very much in church. And that's, why do we make it seem like being a Christian is so easy? Because sometimes it can be very, very difficult very trying, just plain hard. But maybe most of the time it isn't hard. But when we focus on this fifth verse in the psalm and the fifth chapter in Mark, neither writer attempts to gloss over the going through tough and tender times, but considers it a part of just living It's part of the human situation. And no matter how hard we try to avoid facing crises and try to hope that we will not experience what we used to call trials and tribulations, we'll determine in most cases that we can emerge from such times blessed and stronger than when we were treading water in a sea of misery. Now consider how this played out in the life of a certain couple. A volunteer tutor, a teacher, was asked one time to visit a patient in a city hospital. She took the boy's name and his room number and was told by the boy's teacher that they were studying nouns and pronouns and adverbs. But when she got to the room, she realized that she was in the burn unit of the hospital. And when she walked into the room, she saw a little boy who was in a great deal of pain. But shocked by that and not having been prepped for it, she stumbled in and tried to rev up her courage as much as possible by saying, Hi, I'm the hospital teacher. Your teacher asked me to stop by and help you learn about nouns and pronouns and adverbs. And so clumsily she launched into the lesson. The next day when she returned, a nurse saw her coming down the hallway and said, What did you do to that boy? And the tutor immediately became apologetic And the nurse interrupted her and said, no, 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 you don't understand. We have been worried about him. But since you were here, we find he's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as though he decided he wants to live. So when the nurse and the the teacher walked into the boy's room, they asked him, what's so different? And he said, I figured they wouldn't send a teacher to me to work on nouns and pronouns and adverbs with a kid who's dying, would they? Well, in times of 
crisis, it's always natural for us to pray to God with questions like, how much, O oh Lord, how, how much can I endure? Or how long, O oh Lord, how long, good words from the Psalms, will my hurting and my worrying last? And at times like this, these kind of people don't need sympathy and pity as much as they need encouragement. And if we beat ourselves up because we aren't able to encourage them, we can't seem to find the right words, maybe the best encouragement comes with maybe an act of grace. That much needed encouragement happens, just like this little boy, that someone came in and treated him like he was normal. That's how it worked for him. And so sometimes it can work for us either accidentally or serendipitously. That's how it worked for Jesus and Jerus and his daughter, how it worked for Jesus and his counter with a woman who had the bleeding issue of 12 years. Her faith, her, her reaching out, it, it all took audacity just to reach through the crowd and touch Jesus' robe. And I don't know what she intended, whether she meant to just touch it with the end of her finger, whether she meant to stroke it with her palm of her hand. Maybe she even needed, wanted really to grab a piece of it and just jerk, just so she knew she had touched him. Well, the word of faith is that eventually our weeping will stop. Our tears will dry up. And God's joy will come with the dawning of a new day. The message of the church has been the same down through the ages, and that is that God is always going to have the last word. And in the words of the psalmist, joy does come in the morning, even though weeping may linger in the night. And that's, that's not just pie-in-the-sky talk from some naive pilgrim. But as one gifted preacher in a sermon not too long ago said, the Bible was not written by relaxed people, all lathered up with sunscreen, under an umbrella, by the beach, drinking lemonade. The Bible was written by people who had to put life together with short pieces of string. Being there for or with a troubled person can usually be more productive, more helpful, more encouraging than us spending time arm wrestling with our brain in search of trying to find the right or the almost right words. Because sometimes a hug or the holding of a hand or just sitting with a troubled person can be far more comforting and encouraging than spewing a string of words that in the end say little while sounding just a little bit religious, but never addressing the real issues of the heart. So let me tell you this as my parting word. Although Psalm 30 is 3,000 years old, it's just as appropriate a psalm for our time because it was written by a very human person who made his share of mistakes, had his share of success, endured his own times of pain and grief, wished for more faith and hope than he thought he had, just like we all do. We know, we just know in our hearts that eventually believers like us will eventually celebrate with joy in the morning our dark night of the soul because God is going to bring it. Blessed be our God forever. Let us join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders, from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news all might experience transformation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate and empower us to protect all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them toward a fair distribution of resources that none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical or mental illness. Embrace those who are sick. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship. Revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us towards you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Our gifts are the ways in which we can feed and fuel the ministries here at Grace. Just as Jesus felt the power leave from his cloak was touched, our power is to give and our power is to receive those gifts with love. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you.
Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray, amen. There is good news for the captain, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one who rich and fail. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>